Okay, welcome back to Community Matters. Uh, we're here with Rabbi Itchel Krasnjanski. Uh, he's the leader of Chabad Hawaii. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about a holiday that's coming up uh, in the near term in actually two parts. That's Purim. Welcome to the show, Rabbi. Thank you, Jay. It's always a pleasure to be here and specifically to talk about such a joyous upcoming Jewish holiday. I was in Israel in March of um, 1978 at the time of Purim, and I remember how joyous it was. Yes. And when they read the Megillah in the temple, there were, there were these noisemakers, yes. and everybody was having such a good time. Yes. <laughs> so tell us about the holiday. So um, to start with, in, in the Jewish religion, we have biblical holidays, means those holidays that are mentioned in the Bible, like uh, Passover, that's the big one, the, um, the uh, he in Hebrew it's called Shavuos, Pentecost, as well as Feast of the Tabernacle, Sukkot. So these are three biblical holidays that we celebrate that are mentioned in the Bible. But then there are two other important holidays which are uh, post-biblical era and they were enacted by the rabbis and they're rabbinic in nature and they are the two uh, very known Jewish holidays. One is Purim that we're going to talk about today and the other one is Hanukkah. Uh, Hanukkah in the Jewish calendar comes before Purim. Hanukkah we celebrated uh, in uh, December. Mm -hmm. But historically, uh, Purim happened before Hanukkah. Purim happened about 360 years BCE. And it happened uh, after the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem. And after the destruction, the Jews were exiled to Babylon. Uh, but then the Persian Empire took over and the Jews were subject to the Persian king. And that's when the story of Purim takes place. Ahasuerus. Ahasuerus, is correct. <laughs> okay, yeah, this, is, this is interesting. This is before Christ. Yes. This is hundreds of years before yes. Christ. Yes. And the Jews had lost uh, what? The, the temple. The temple. And they were, they were sent to Babylon exactly. and thus ultimately to Persia, Persia, now known as Iran. Same country. Correct. Yeah. correct. Uh, and this was the worst thing you could do in those times was to ostracize and send people away from their homeland, yeah. Well, that's the exile. There was great suffering uh, at that time for the Jewish people. Um, there is a Jewish historian called Josephus. Josephus was a general. Uh, this is actually uh, in the Second Temple era. He was a general uh, for the Jewish army. But then he became a traitor. He joined uh, the Roman legions. They actually made him into a general for the other side. <laughs> and even though he was a traitor, but he was a, a great historian. And he wrote down uh, not only his battles, the battles with the Jews against the Romans during the Second Temple era, uh, but he also wrote about uh, briefly about the Jewish, uh, uh, the First Temple era. And uh, we uh, talk about it today as an historical event, but it was a Holocaust uh, like we've witnessed in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Where everyone was killed. Yeah, there were millions and hundreds of thousands of Jews killed. And uh, the rest were exiled. And um, This is by the Romans. Also by the Romans, but first by uh, Nebuchadnezzar. That's the Hebrew name for the Babylonian king that destroyed the first temple and exiled the Jews. Boy, we were having Israel. a hard time in those days. And today, Every time you look, we were being killed and our structures and holy places were being destroyed. Yes, but uh, what we always preserved was our sense of humor. And the saying is, or to sum up Jewish history, is that we live, they try to kill us, we won, let's sit down and eat now <laughs> <laughs> and celebrate. Well, you know, the culture is a very strong culture, and the, the documents are very strong documents, and the customs are very strong customs. You know, you talk about these holidays, they, they tend to perpetuate the religion. 
There's people sure. coming from all over the world to celebrate these, these holidays. For sure. And interestingly enough, the festival of Purim is perhaps the most joyous of all the holidays in the Jewish calendar. It is the story of uh, Jewish, uh, a miraculous um, uh, victory and survival of the Jewish people. And uh, just in short, to recap, to recap the whole story oh, of please. Purim, is that uh, the Jews were subject to uh, the subjects of the Persian Empire, and the king at the time was uh, King Ahasuerus. And um, the story uh, opens up. This is the uh, the scroll of Esther, which you refer to as the Megillah. That's the uh, Hebrew word for the scroll. And the story is taken on another meaning. Yes. That word. It's like the whole Megillah, the whole story. <laughs> the whole Megillah. It's a right. long story. Exactly. <laughs> but in fact, it's not that long. And in fact, it's really an interesting story. It's a fascinating story that took place over many, many years. Um, so, um, uh, King Ahasuerus, the third year of his reign, uh, decided to throw a huge, huge party uh, to uh, celebrate his uh, kingship. And he invited all the subjects of, his land, of the country, including the Jewish people, and uh, threw a big feast and celebrated. The feast took place uh, for a duration of six months, as the Megillah tells us. Uh, a lot longer than a presidential inaugural party today. <laughs> and um, wh at the party, when he got drunk, he called for his wife, the queen, her name was Vashti, and he called and he wanted to parade her in front of all of the guests to show everyone how beautiful she was. Um, but she thought that was ridiculous. She refused to uh, come out to, to, to the guests. And as a result of that, uh, Ahasuerus uh, consulted with his advisors and they said, you have to put your foot down because uh, if you don't, then it will be, uh, it will be established that the, w the wives don't have to listen to their husbands. Uh, and Vashti <laughs> would do it again and again. <laughs> right, and all the wives would. would all would, the wives, would, would, right. would, So it was off with her head. Oh. Oh. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after he sobered up and he realized what the stupid thing that he did, he had to look for a new wife, a new queen. So they had this pageant and uh, all the, the pretty girls. Were, Literally a beauty contest. A beauty huh? contest, exactly. <laughs> Perhaps one of the first ones in the annals of history. And there was one Jewish girl, one Jewish woman. Her name was Esther, mm -hmm. uh, who uh, was the niece of, of the leader of the Jews at that time, whose name was Mordechai. He was mm. part of the, uh, the, the Jewish, the Jewish Supreme, community, the yeah. Jewish Supreme Court. He was oh, one of the leaders. He was a judge. He was a, yeah. Supreme judge and uh, Supreme Court judge. And um, so she was drafted in into this beauty pageant. She didn't want to go, um, but she went anyways. Uh, she didn't have a choice. And the king uh, set his eyes on her <laughs> and made her queen. From all of the uh, contestants, she uh, became the queen. So her uncle Mordechai instructed her not to let Ahasuerus know her nationality and the fact that she was Jewish. Ah, okay. Now, uh, while this was happening, uh, King Ahasuerus had a minister who was like the prime minister, the head minister of his ministers, and his name was... Enter Haman. Haman, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what an awful name that is. You know? It bespeaks of evilness. <laughs> it does, and he actually was an evil player. He was an anti-Semite, and he hated the Jewish people, partly because the custom at that time was people would bow to the ministers. Because Mordechai would not bow down to him. Stiff-necked, eh? Because we, the Jewish people, only bow down to God. Uh -huh. uh, that enraged him. And he would discuss this with his wife. And she said, um, forget about Mordechai. It's the Jewish people. All of the Jewish people are like that. So um, Haman decided that he was going to devise a scheme. And that was to uh, go to the king and petition 
for the king to allow him to annihilate all the Jewish people in all of his 127 countries that, that he was the ruler of. Because Persia was powerful in those Persia days. Persia was the, was the superpower in those days. Yeah. And uh, while this was happening, something else happened. That is that um, Mordechai, because uh, his niece was now the queen, he would hang around the royal palace just, you know, to, to, to uh, watch and make sure that she was doing okay. Mordechai, as being uh, the judge in the Supreme Jewish Court, he was very knowledgeable, obviously, but also he knew all the languages at, of that day. And one day when he was in the court, uh, King's Palace, he overheard two employees of the king uh, hatch, uh, talking about uh, a plan to poison the king because they had a grievance against the king. So when Mordechai heard this, he immediately sent word to the queen, to Esther, saying that um, this is what they're planning to do. So she immediately passed that information on to the king, and the, and the, uh, the, the, uh, they averted uh, this, uh, you know, this, uh, you know the king, from the king being killed. And the king was happy for and that. The king was very, very happy. Now... <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, Haman is plotting to uh, petition the king to destroy all the Jewish people. So as the story goes in the Megillah, in the scroll of Esther, one night the king couldn't sleep. So he asked his uh, attendants, bring out the royal uh, record book of what's happening here and uh, read to me <laughs> some bedtime story. <laughs> so they uh, brought out this big book. And it just happened to fall out on this page of the story where Mordechai uh, saved the king's life by overhearing the two uh, employees wanting to kill the king. So the king asked them, did we reward him for saving my life? And they said, it doesn't say. We don't think so. While this was happening, all of a sudden there was a big knock on the door, a heavy knock on the door. And he said, who's here in the middle of the night? And they went to the door and they saw Haman there, the prime minister. And he said he has something urgent to discuss with the king. So the king said, bring him in. And he came in and he said, there is a nation. He says, dear king, your highness, there's a nation called the Jewish people. And they're different than us. They follow a different uh, way of life, worship different gods, a different god." And they're not good for the homogeny of, of our people. I suggest that we um, institute a decree to annihilate all the Jewish people on one day, one given day. And uh, to sweeten the deal, Haman said, I will bring from my, uh, from my treasures you know, a vast sum of money to the king's treasures. And the king said, okay, you know, he didn't, uh, the king wasn't a friend of the Jews either. He didn't know Esther was Jewish. So uh, he said, okay. So uh, the uh, decree went out that all the Jewish people, uh, all the Jewish people, uh, this and this day, all the Persian people have the right to, t to bear arms and to kill the Jewish people uh, of that day. Why that day? So uh, Haman threw a lot, a lottery, just, just threw a dart on the, on, on the board, see which day. And in, in Persian, lottery is called Purim. Oh, oh. <laughs> okay. So um, by chance or by lottery, this was the day that was chosen to annihilate all the Jewish people. Now, I, I, I misspoke before because the decree happened before. The decree happened a while before. The night that Haman came to, uh, to talk to the king was about something else. He came to talk to the king because he had enough with Mordechai not bowing down to him that he had this suggestion or he wanted the king's permission to hang Haman in the city square um, 
to hang Mordechai. I'm sorry, to hang Mordechai. I apologize. To hang Mordechai at the city square for, for not bowing down to Haman. So this knock on the door and this request came right at the time that Ahasuerus was reading about Mordechai saving his life. <laughs> so Ahasuerus thought for a second. He said to Haman, tell me, what would you recommend how, would the, how should the king show uh, his appreciation to someone who's very dear to the king? What should we do to someone like that? So Haman, the very arrogant ministers, thought to himself, who can the king be talking about if not for me? So he said, someone who the king really admires uh, should be led through the city square on the king's ro on the royal horse, with attendants all, in sound, all, all around, and they should all, you know, uh, shout out in the streets that this is how the king honors he who he admires. So Ahasuerus says, well, that's a very, very good suggestion. Now you go and you take Mordechai, put him on my horse, and you walk him <laughs> through the city. <laughs> so things began to, to, to turn around already. Now, when Haman came out with a decree... This is an important part of the story. Uh, Mordechai, who was the leader of the Jewish people at the time, and the way the Jews look at the world is that it's all, uh, everything that happens is no coincidences, there's no, mis there's no uh, accidents. It's all meant to be. And if, if the Jewish people were, were facing such a potential uh, decree of annihilation, we must have done something wrong that, uh, that um, you know, that got, got, got angry at us and upset with us. So Mordechai rallied all the Jewish people to repent and to strengthen their connection to God. And at the same time, uh, he sent word to Esther that Esther, now is the time to go to the king, reveal to him your identity, and plead for the Jewish people. So Esther sent word back that, first of all, uh, she asked that all the people fast uh, for three days in a way, of, uh, a way of a form of repentance and asking God for forgiveness for anything wrong we may have done. And she herself also would fast. And then she would go to the king. But she's reluctant because the, uh, the, the, royal, in the royal court, even if you're a wife, you couldn't just go into the king's chamber. You have to be summoned by the king. And if you weren't summoned by the king, there is uh, a danger that it would be off with your head as well. <laughs> like wife number one. Poor Vashti. <laughs> <laughs> so Mordechai responds to her and with the famous lines, and, and he says to her, uh, God will deliver the Jewish people from this danger as he has in the past. But, if, but who knows, if not for this moment, you were placed in this station in life to be the king's queen. Seize the moment. Because otherwise, this is why you're here. This is why you're here. <laughs> <laughs> so she does go to the king. And she says, uh, I have one request. And he says, what? And he says, I'd like to throw a party, a private party, and invite you and the prime minister, Haman. And the king said, yeah, sure. King said to her when he, when he saw her, rather than be upset, he was very happy that she came and he, and he extended his uh, the king's uh, staff. And after all, she was beautiful, <laughs> right? <laughs> and um, he said to her, uh, in the words of the Megillah, "Ask me anything you want, up to half of the kingdom." Is, you know. <laughs> and uh, so he invited. She invited um, Haman to the party. And Haman uh, was so uh, excited that he, only he and uh, the king were invited to this party that he talked to his friends and he said that um, every, life is so good except for this Mordechai, this Jew and the Jewish people who don't want to, uh, who don't want to respect me and Mordechai doesn't want to bow down to me. But the day will come soon, the day when they when they chose for all the Jews to be slaughtered. So uh, he comes to the party, and it was a nice party and everything, and then at the end of the party, the, uh, 
a strange ask Esther, so what can I do? What would you like to request? So uh, she said, my request is if you can come next week to another party, again, with you and Heyman, I, I want to do another private party. So the king, fine. So he comes again. And then at the end of that party, the king says, and what um, can I do for you? What is this all about? And she says that, um, I, that uh, I need to ask you to save my people who are in uh, danger of annihilation. And he says, what are you talking about? He said, because me and my people, meaning the Jewish people, have been, uh, have been uh, decreed, you know, uh, set up for this um, slaughter. And the king turned to Haman, he put two and two together. And, um, and in great anger, he said to Esther, is this the man who uh, you're referring to? And she said, yes. So all of a sudden, everything turned around. And now Haman, from being all happy with himself. Now, he himself, was, it was off with his head. <laughs> so, the story of Purim is a story where things turn around from a day of potential sadness and tragedy to a day of great rejoicing, because uh, Ahasuerus immediately called in Mordechai, and they uh, reversed the decree, and they said that the Jewish people sh should take up arms and defend themselves, and and, uh, and uh, therefore, there wasn't this massacre that everyone was afraid of. So that's basically the story of Purim. And uh, every, every year since, um, Mordechai and Esther instituted that Jews come together and celebrate, uh, have a, f a feast, and as well as to give gifts to the poor. And that's the custom on Purim. You give food gifts uh, to one another. It's called Mishloach Manas. Also to give money to the poor. And, and to have homentashim. And to have Hamantashen. Can you tell the people what Hamantashen is? Hamantashen, uh, I don't know if, there, if, if I can explain it really good, but Hamantashen is a kind of pastry. It's a cookie that's uh, triangle in shape. And uh, I guess because Haman's hat, the hat that they wore then was triangle in shape. So... Um, Purim is a day, the way we rejoice on Purim, especially children, is we masquerade in, uh, in uh, you know, in The co various costume. characters. The various right? characters. Somebody play Achish Vero, somebody... Esther, right? the girls play Hanan, Esther. Yeah. Esther, Mordecai, yeah. exactly. the regular players, yeah. Exactly. In costume. In yeah. costume, exactly. <laughs> and they read the Megillah. Yeah. Exactly. And they have these uh, noisemakers, exactly. right? Exactly. Every time Haman's name is mentioned in the Megillah, <laughs> he's booed and he's, dr he's drowned out. <laughs> But Purim, it being a very festive, joyous holiday, also is a very meaningful holiday, and it is very relevant. The message Tell of, us why. The, really important. Tell us why. The message of Purim is a very relevant message, because the commentaries point out something very interesting. The commentaries point out that this, the scroll of Esther is part of the Old Testament, one of the 24 books canonized as part of the Old Testament. It is the only book of the Old Testament that God's name is not mentioned even once. All throughout the Bible, God's name is mentioned all the time. God spoke and God said and all this and that. But God's name is not mentioned even once. Why? Because God's name not being mentioned represents a concealment, a hiding of God's face, so to speak. Throughout history, there were periods of time when God's face or God's guiding hand was very apparent and very, and, and very open. But there were periods in our time in, uh, that this was the first exile where God's face was hidden, meaning it seemed as if God abandoned the Jewish people. It seemed as if God uh, was no longer in control and other forces, evil forces were we're, we're, we're taking over and uh, responsible for all, the, uh, for all the suffering. But the story of, uh, of Esther, when you step back, was a great miracle. There was nothing in the story that you can point to, say, this is the miracle. For example, we know that biblically there was the splitting of the Red Sea. When the Jewish people left Egypt, there was the splitting of the Red Sea. So that was an open and revered miracle God set aside the laws of nature, and all of a sudden, the water stood. 
But in the story of Purim, there was, no, there was nothing like that. There was mm -hmm. no, no moment that you can say, here, the, the sea split or whatever. But there was a series of events that fell into place in such a perfect timing where Haman comes to Ahasuerus to get the green light to kill Mordechai right after uh, he's been told that Mordechai saved the day, that Haman in his stupor kills Vashti, so Esther is now in the right place so that at the right time she can step forward and save the Jewish people. There's a literary quality about it. Yes. You know, and as you tell the story, I love the story. <laughs> as you tell the story, um, one can imagine a, a, a Broadway play with the story. Yes. One can imagine a movie with the story. In fact, for me, one can imagine an opera with the story because there's such passion involved, there is, some there redemption. Is. There is. Anyway, Rabbi, thank you so much for telling us this story. <laughs> You'll have to come back in a couple of weeks and we'll expand on it or we'll go to the next holiday, um, the, uh, what do you call it, Purim Katan, which is yes. Little Purim. Right. It's going to be in March and the Big Purim is going to be in April. So we Actually, should... no, the Little Purim will be in February. In February. And the Big Purim will be in March. In March, okay. Right? 30 days. So we can talk some more about Just it. Just one last thought, the closing line is that the message of Purim, and this is the profound message of Purim, Two points. One is that where we think God is absent, He's actually more present in the moments and in the, in the experiences when we feel He's absent than when we think He's present. Yeah. So never feel that never He has abandoned, abandoned you. Us. Right. Even if His name is not in, 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 in exactly. that part of the Bible. As well as the idea of, as we talked last time, the need to, the need to rejoice always and to celebrate the miracles and the good blessings that we have in life. Thank you, Rabbi, as always. Thank you. Wonderful to see you. We'll see Pleasure. you next time soon. Yes, thank you. Aloha. Shalom.